Welcome to Homeland, 10 Stories, 1 Israel. Israel has brought together millions of Jews from across the diaspora in the world's most chaotic family reunion. This podcast is about what that really looks like. Though the series is fictional, each person is based on real stories shared with us by real people. In our final episode, we turn to Emily. At 22, she's not totally sure what she's doing with her life. And on bad days, she's really not sure why she decided, pretty impulsively, to take a semester off and fly halfway across the world to interrogate strangers on public transit. But like so many young American Jews, she's looking for something. And she has a sneaking sense she just might find it here, in Israel. Emily Cohen loves public speaking. She's led her high school debate team to the state championships, acted enthusiastically, if not particularly skillfully, in all her high school's plays, made her friends suffer through endless practice sessions before every class presentation. But now everyone is staring at her, waiting for her to say something profound, or at least interesting. And she has absolutely nothing. So, what do you guys want to know? <laughs> Whatever you want to tell us. Like, why I'm here and stuff? Sure, if that's something you want to talk about. It's not really that interesting. Well, I have a hidden agenda. I've got a kid about your age. Maybe you can give me some insight. <laughs> Is your kid super neurotic? Disgustingly well-adjusted, actually. Thanks to a mother, not me. <laughs> and I definitely can't give you any insight. Uh, maybe she can call me. Tell me her secret. <laughs> Seriously, though, it probably wasn't easy taking time off of school. Actually, that might have been the easiest part. That's surprising. You seem like the sort of person who would love school. I can't tell if that's a dig or a compliment, but it's 100% true either way, so I'm not mad. <laughs> I don't know if this was a thing in Australia in the 90s, but like, you know the girl who always has, like, ten different sparkly gel pens and color codes all her notes? I always borrowed pens and paper from that kind of girl. And test answers sometimes. Not that I'm proud of it. Right. Well, that's me. Organized, custom planners. <laughs> My favorite thing is school supplies, followed closely by school. Actually, it's like what Shia was saying about how much he loves learning, but for me, it was mixed up with loving recognition and getting A's. <laughs> it's silly. I know that rationally. But it also gave me a real sense of fulfillment for a long time. So why take the time off school if it gave you so much? I mean, a bunch of reasons, but the most obvious one is that my grandpa died a few months ago a month into my senior year or so. I don't know. School seemed kind of pointless after that. I'm so sorry. Thanks. Anyway, I feel like maybe that was the start of a lot of complicated stuff for me. Were you close? I think he may have been my closest family member in some ways, actually. Which makes no sense, right? <laughs> he was 70 when I was born, but he was so... <sighs> He was just my favorite person. Kind of like Ortal and her grandmother. Is he the person who got you so interested in stories? Maybe indirectly, but when I was with him, we mostly talked about me. I really wish I thought to ask him more about him, you know? But, I mean, compared to most of you, he didn't have such a crazy story. He didn't walk through the desert or survive pogrom or even emigrate. I mean, I know he had it tough when he was young, but he was pretty comfortable by the time I was born, you know? And I grew up that way too, which I know sounds so privileged and obnoxious. You don't have to apologize because your life wasn't difficult. <laughs> Neither was mine. I was a little punk who liked to skip school and make his parents worry. We're all normal, Emily. I spent most of my time sewing costumes. Not thinking about trauma or struggles or whatever. Yeah, I guess. Was your grandpa religious? <laughs> not at all. Like, not even a little. But he was really Jewish, you know? He's the reason I came here specifically. Sometimes, Emily Cohen felt like a big fat liar. 
She knew it wasn't nice to lie, but six-year-old Emily learned the hard way that telling the truth wasn't always the best option. Like when she told her brother's girlfriend, Avery, exactly what she thought about her junior prom dress. But she asked me if I thought she looked pretty, Emily had protested, still not understanding why everyone was so angry at her. Yes, but sweetie, sometimes it's okay not to tell the truth if you're going to hurt someone's feelings, Mom had explained. You didn't want to make Avery cry, did you? No. Emily hadn't wanted to make Avery cry. She didn't want to make anyone feel bad. So when Olivia asked, Am I your best friend? Emily said, Yes, because she didn't want to hurt Olivia's feelings. It was only sort of a lie. Olivia was her best friend at school. Just like Priya was her best friend from the neighborhood, and Madeline was her best friend in orchestra. But Grandpa Saul was her best, best friend. The person she liked the most in the world. No one else had a grandpa like she did. Grandpa didn't miss dinner because of meetings. He didn't spend her soccer games on his cell phone, looking up to cheer distractedly whenever he heard other parents cheering. He remembered that Hannah Kay was the mean Hannah, and Hannah Yee was the nice one. He didn't care that she was a terrible violin player, and he didn't lie and tell her that she'd sound good if she just practiced. Not everything is for everyone, kiddo, he'd say. You know you're allowed to quit, right? She is absolutely not allowed to quit, Emily's mother would cut in sharply. She is going to play in the spring recital, and she is going to be great, right, Em? Mom truly believed it, too. She really believed that Emily could be the best if she just tried. So, Emily tried. At violin, at gymnastics, at debate, at pottery, at AP classes and newspaper and student government. And all that trying paid off. In the end, she was pretty good. Because she worked her butt off. Her parents were so proud. Dad built a shelf for her trophies and ribbons. Mom made copies of her report cards and tests and hung them on the fridge. Only Grandpa Saul didn't seem to care if she won or got an A+. He was proud of her, even when she missed a note in orchestra or came in second in debate. It took bravery to get up there, kid, he'd say. That's what matters. My girl's got gumption. Yeah, but Grandpa, I sucked, Emily pointed out after a particularly rough debate in ninth grade. Exactly, Grandpa Saul said, completely unbothered by Emily's language. You sucked, and you went up there and did it anyway. That's something to be proud of. It's not about the result. Yeah, it is, Grandpa, she said. It's debate. The whole point is to win. Look at me, kiddo, Grandpa said, gesturing to his cane. This was a new addition after a recent fall. A reminder that Grandpa Saul was getting older. I suck at walking now. Oh, Grandpa, you don't suck at walking. Sure I do. I'm slow and I have to take breaks and my marathon days are behind me. Grandpa, you never ran a marathon. Grandpa Saul often said that his favorite exercise was arguing with his daughters, who were lawyers just like he had been. Not the point, kid. The point is that even though I suck at walking, I'm still doing it. I'm still getting out of my easy chair and putting on these hideous orthopedic shoes and showing up to see my brilliant, beautiful granddaughter debate. And that's what matters. Emily frowned. But Grandpa, you fell. It's not embarrassing that you have to walk slower. That's right. And it's not embarrassing to lose. It's good for you. Makes you tough. Makes it more impressive when you get back up and try again. Got it? Yeah, I got it. Though, privately, Emily felt that Grandpa definitely would not have taken his own advice. He liked to win, especially when he argued with Mom. And he argued with Mom a lot. Like February of her sophomore year, when he suggested that Emily spend the coming summer in Israel. Israel, Mom said. Why would she go to Israel? Emily knew distantly that Grandpa Saul was very interested in Israel. He donated to Israeli charities and had strong opinions about Israeli politics, which, predictably, 
he and Mom argued about all the time. And he talked often of his trips to Israel, both before and after the war, which war she had no idea. But this suggestion that Emily go to Israel, this was new. Why shouldn't she go to Israel? Grandpa Saul asked Mom. Why? She's an American. It's the summer before her junior year. That's an important year for college applications, Mom argued. Good. So this will make her look diverse, Grandpa shot back. Volunteering, traveling, maybe learning some Hebrew. I'd really rather have her spend her summer doing something relevant, Mom said. Not to mention safer. Well, why don't you ask her? Grandpa Saul suggested. He turned to Emily. Would you want to go to Israel for the summer? Uh, Emily looked between Grandpa and Mom. She didn't want to disappoint either one of them. Plus, it's not that she didn't want to go to Israel. She just had no particular desire to go. Especially not if it was going to be like Hebrew school all over again. I don't know, Grandpa, she said finally. It's kind of far away. And Mom is right. I should be thinking about something that looks good on my college applications. And volunteering in Israel won't look good? He asked. I was thinking about trying to get an internship, actually, Emily said. Or maybe doing a week or two of debate camp to prep for next school year. Grandpa Saul sighed. Well, it's your choice, kiddo. But I think you should consider going. Maybe doing one of those birthright trips. Explore your heritage a little bit more. I'm 16, Grandpa. Birthright is for college kids. Well, you'll be a college kid soon enough, he said. Maybe you can do your study abroad there. Why don't we stop making plans that are so far in the future and start focusing on what's right in front of us, Mom asked, like figuring out what Emily's going to do this summer. She was gloating. It was subtle, but Emily knew the signs. Grandpa Saul sighed noisily. Well, maybe it'll be a graduation present. What do you think, kid? A trip to Israel with your favorite moldering bag of bones? Grandpa, you aren't moldering. Emily wrapped her arms around Grandpa and kissed the top of his head. Keep up the flattery, kid, and I'll throw in a car, Grandpa teased. But by the time Emily graduated from high school, Grandpa was in no position to fly anywhere, let alone to Israel. He was still sharp-tongued and feisty, still argued with his daughter and came to Emily's tournaments, but it cost him. He wheezed when he walked too far, started napping in the afternoons, lost an alarming amount of weight. I'm sorry we can't go on our Israel trip, kiddo, he said the night of her graduation. The doc says it's not such a great idea. Oh, Grandpa, Emily said, that's okay. I don't really care about going to Israel. I care about spending time with you. You're a good girl, I am, he said, taking her hand. But promise me you'll do one of those birthright things when you get to college. Find yourself a nice Jewish boy. Or girl, I don't care. I'm open-minded. I'm with the times. Just find them while I'm still around, so I can hear all about it. What if I never get married, Emily teased. As long as you're happy, my love, Grandpa said. He looked her directly in the eye. Listen, kid, because this is important. I don't care about you being salutatorian or debate champion. I only care that you're happy. You're happy, I'm happy. You got that? I got it, Grandpa. Good. He squeezed her hand. Now, let's go get some of this celebratory cake. Your grandpa sounds wonderful. He was. He was such a good person. Such a good grandfather. I'm not surprised to hear that you were very good at school. Where did you end up going to university? I stayed close to home, actually. I go to UT. UT? Uh, spell it out for the non-Americans. Oh, sorry. Uh, university of Texas. Austin campus. I still can't believe you're from Texas. You know, there are Jews in Texas. Hey, my wife's from New Zealand. You can be Jewish almost anywhere. Exactly. <laughs> Not that we did a ton of Jewish stuff. My parents forced me to go to Hebrew school, and we went to temple twice a year. Oh, and most years, we had a Seder. And that was it. Did you have a Christmas tree? No. 
Just because we weren't orthodox doesn't mean we celebrated Christian holidays. You're right. That was an unfair assumption. But you felt Jewish? I mean, my last name is Cohen. (laughs) It's not like I was trying to hide it. It just wasn't a big part of my life. Was it a big part of your grandfather's life? Not in, like, a day-to-day way. He grew up in a pretty secular household. His parents came to New York from Russia, or somewhere that used to be Russia. And I think they were probably religious till they got here. It's kind of similar to what happened with your family, Amalia. Like if Hesia had come to New York instead of here. Pretty classic, early 20th century immigrant story. And your father's side? German on one side, I think maybe Polish on the other, but he's also second generation. So, you know, none of my grandparents had accents or anything, unless you count New York accents. How'd they end up in Texas of all places? Work. Oil at first, actually. You know, you could all come visit Texas and see for yourself that it's not some kind of, I don't know, wild west. It's a good place to grow up. I'm sure it's a lovely place. So, did you take your grandpa's advice? Try and find a nice Jewish boy? Or girl? Sort of. I found a Jewish boy who wasn't particularly nice, but he introduced me to someone who was. Emily's friends really didn't like her on-again, off-again boyfriend. To be fair, Emily often didn't like her on-again, off-again boyfriend. Josh Rabinowitz hadn't seemed like a terrible person when they first met, He was charismatic and funny and smart. He'd read Emily's papers before she'd turn them in, bring her chocolate-covered espresso beans before tests. But he could also be selfish and distant and withdrawn, more interested in catching up on all the things he wasn't allowed to do growing up in an Orthodox home, like going out on Friday nights or eating non-kosher food or chasing girls. It was during a particularly bad fight that Emily learned the concept of rumspringa. Let me get this straight, Emily said, rubbing the bridge of her nose, just like Mom whenever she was about to deliver the killing blow. You stood me up, stayed out all night with another girl, didn't answer any of my calls or texts, and you expect me to feel bad that you're hungover because... What? You resent that you couldn't go out on Friday nights when you were growing up? Is that really your excuse for why you're being such a jerk? Josh exhaled noisily. It's not an excuse, Emily. It's like, this is my rumspringa. You know, like when Amish kids get to go out in the world for the first time to see if they would rather be Amish or not Amish? What are you even saying, Josh? Emily glared at him. You're not Amish. Yeah, but like, I'm doing all the stuff I wasn't allowed to do as a kid, you know? What, treating people horribly? You know, Josh, I am sorry your parents were strict. I'm sorry you grew up feeling, I don't know, stifled or whatever. I'm sorry that you're mad that you had to go to Orthodox school, but none of that means you get to be a jerk to me. This is done. I am done. And she was done. For a while. But Josh always managed to weasel his way back in somehow. I don't get it her roommate Meadow said. He's the actual worst. Why do you keep doing this to yourself? I can't explain it, Meadow. I really can't. Uh, How do I look? Emily did a little twirl. You look great. It's a total waste of effort because he doesn't deserve it. He's got a high school friend visiting, Emily explained. Someone he was really close with. I want to make a good impression. Why? His friends are probably as awful as he is. Probably. Okay, I'm going. See you later. But Josh's high school friend wasn't awful at all. He also wasn't a he. Emily was taken aback when she saw Josh standing at the entrance of the UT Hillel, talking to a girl with curly brown hair. Even more so when Josh introduced the girl as Aviva, his best friend from high school. Hey, I've heard so much about you. Aviva surprised Emily by going in for a hug. I wish I could say the same, Emily said, disentangling herself gently. Josh has been very secretive. Ugh, he's the worst, isn't he? Aviva shot Josh an affectionate look. Josh didn't even have the good grace to look ashamed. Come on, guys, 
I don't want to be late for Mincha. She led them into the building before Emily could ask what Mincha was. What the hell, Josh? Emily whispered as they followed Aviva. Why didn't you tell me your best friend from high school is a girl? Why does it matter? Josh asked, confused. It doesn't. What matters is that you didn't tell me. It feels like you were trying to hide it from me. Is she staying with you? Is that why you didn't want to tell me? Because I wouldn't have cared at all if you weren't trying to keep it some kind of secret. Staying with... Oh, oh my God, Em. You have totally the wrong idea, Josh said. Aviva's from. Of course she's not staying with me. She's sleeping in the Chabad house. She's what? Religious. Orthodox. Like, actually. Because she wants to be, not because someone is making her. Oh. This was a new concept to Emily. Josh talked about religion like it was a cage. She just assumed that everyone he grew up with felt that way. It was weird to think that people their age chose to keep all these rules when they didn't have to. You'll like her, I promise, Josh was saying. And you have nothing to worry about. She's just my friend. She's the only person I could talk to when I realized I didn't want to be religious anymore. Josh was right. Emily did like Aviva. Like Josh, she was charismatic and quick-witted and sharp-tongued. Unlike Josh, she seemed thoughtful and generous. She actually seemed to like being orthodox. And she was one of the few people Emily knew, orthodox or not, who seemed totally comfortable with who she was. She and Emily connected immediately. You sure you want to go back to Philly? Emily asked at the end of the weekend, as Aviva was packing up her things to return to school. Josh was waiting downstairs to drive her to the airport. You could transfer here and we could gang up on Josh all the time. Aviva laughed. That boy is beyond help. But then her face turned serious. He's got to figure a lot of stuff out. I don't think he's ready to be, like, a real partner until he does that. Yeah, I guess. Emily felt her mood deflate. She knew Aviva was right. You really are awesome, Aviva said. Seriously, his whole rum spring of BS has nothing to do with you. Thanks, Emily muttered. I mean it. Aviva paused. Look, I hope this isn't weird, but I'd really love to keep in touch, independent of Josh. We don't have to talk about him ever. I'd really like that, Emily said. Awesome. I'm back in Texas all the time for holidays and stuff. Or you could come visit Philly. See the Ivy League up close, Emily teased. <laughs> exactly. They make you answer a riddle before you're allowed in, but that kind of seems like your thing, honestly. Emily laughed. It was so good to meet you. This time, she was the one who went in for the hug. Emily didn't really expect Aviva to keep in touch. They were all busy. They all had their own stuff going on, but Aviva surprised her. She texted, commented on social media posts, and when the pandemic hit and the world shut down, she started sending Emily letters. Handwritten ones. Hunt unicorn stationery. So, Emily wrote back. Writing to Aviva felt good. Comfortable and intimate at the same time. Longer than texts or DMs. More personal than emails. And special. Emily couldn't remember the last time she'd written someone an honest-to-God letter. So maybe this was why it was so easy to tell Aviva all sorts of personal things. Like how sad she was about Grandpa Saul. How Josh had made her worry that she was unlovable somehow. How lonely she'd been as a kid. How addicted she'd become to the warm glow of praise from parents, from professors, even from friends. It was Aviva who gave Emily the confidence to end things with Josh for good. True, he'd left her wary and cynical and a little bit bitter, but she'd never truly be able to hate him or even forget about him because he'd also introduced her to Aviva. Your boyfriend seems like a total jerk. He was pretty toxic. I really don't think he's like inherently awful, but... He was confused and angsty, and it just made him the worst. It's not a great sign when everyone in your life hates the person you're dating, you know? 
Why do you think he kept dating him? I don't know. I mean, I genuinely cannot explain why I liked him so much. But also, I think he was like a challenge. I wanted to win, you know? I wanted to get this ungettable guy. I wanted to be the exception. Sounds like you were thinking about him like a school project. Yeah, exactly. Like, if you just try hard enough, you get what you want. It was a a learning experience. Weirdly, I don't think I would have been open to coming here if I hadn't had that experience. How do you mean? I mean, objectively, my relationship with Josh was a failure, right? He treated me badly. I was unhappy. It ended badly. But it wasn't a waste of time. I learned from it. And I think after a while that made me realize... I don't know, that I had this really messed up idea that if you're not the best, then you're a total failure. No in-between. I think he made me realize that there is an in-between. Probably all of life is kind of an in-between. You know? That's very wise. (laughs) It took a lot of crying and therapy to get to that point. But yeah, so... I don't know. When I got the urge to just, like, take time off school and come here, even though I didn't have an internship or a job or a plan and I wasn't getting credit for it, it was like, hey, this is an experience you have to go through. You're going to learn from it, even if you can't point to a line on your resume or a gold star or whatever, you know? And I think that's what Grandpa Saul had been trying to tell me my whole life. I just didn't listen. That's really beautiful. Thanks. So, did you decide to come here because you broke up with this guy? No, not exactly. By the end of Emily's junior year in the spring of 2021, Grandpa Saul was extremely frail. Mom had encouraged Emily and her older brother Seth to spend as much time with him as possible. I just don't know how much time he has left, she said. He's going to want to spend as much time as possible with you. The second her last paper was turned in, Emily heaved her suitcase into the trunk of her car and drove back to Dallas to soak up as much time as she could with her grandpa. He'd refused to move to a hospital, laughed when Emily's mom had offered to move him into the spare bedroom downstairs, and told Aunt Carmen that if she moved into his house, he'd be moving out. Thought I got rid of you when you turned 18, Carmen, he joked. No way I'm letting you back in here. Emily's mom relayed all of this to her over FaceTime. In her stories, Grandpa sounded exactly the same, ornery and delightfully sarcastic. And when Emily talked to him on the phone, his voice was a little slower maybe, but he was still Grandpa. So she wasn't prepared for how he looked when she finally arrived at his house in Dallas how shrunken and unwell. Grandpa? She said uncertainly, hovering in the doorway, where he sat on the couch watching the news with the sound muted. Can I come in? Emily? Is that you? How's my beautiful, brilliant granddaughter doing? He made to get up, but she rushed to his side. It was discomforting hearing Grandpa's voice, seeing his sharp eyes peering out from the wasted body of a stranger. Things are fine, Grandpa. What are you watching? Anything good? Of course not, he said. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. Look what they're doing. Look how they're reporting it. Unbelievable! On the screen, a night sky lit up with flashes from rockets. Buildings collapsing. Sobbing parents cradling tiny children. The Chiron? Israel continues aerial assault on Gaza. Oh no, Emily said. Grandpa, are you sure you want to watch this? We can change the channel. Kid, look what they're saying. You want to be a journalist? Don't you recognize bias when you see it? Emily looked at the screen again. I mean, this looks like a bad situation all around, Grandpa. Why do you think they're bombing Gaza, hmm? For fun? You think they're aiming at civilians? I don't know, Grandpa. I haven't really been paying attention. Finals, you know? Kid, you want to cover the news for a living, 
This is the kind of stuff you have to know. You know, you watch the news, they make it look simple. Good guys and bad guys. And we're the bad guys. For defending ourselves against terrorism, we're the bad guys. They've got a terror group running the lives of a million people, indoctrinating children, aiming rockets at civilians, sending incendiary balloons to burn fields, and we're the bad guys. He glared at the screen. Tell the truth, you lousy cowards! Grandpa, why don't we turn off the TV for a second? Talk about other stuff? I should have gone back there, he said. At least one more time. I should have brought Lucy with me. Lucy was Emily's grandma. She died when Emily was three. Gone back where, Grandpa? To Israel, he said. Your grandma never saw it. Your mom either. We should have gone as a family. Emily didn't want to lie, to say something cheap like, we can still go, because they weren't going to go. Grandpa was never going to go anywhere ever again. Well, I'm going to go, Grandpa. It's on my list. Put it at the top of the list, Emily. The top. I don't think it's a great idea to go there now, she said, gesturing to the screen. But Grandpa wasn't listening. Remarkable people, he muttered. You know, I thought about going over there in 48. I was 18. I should have gone. I wanted to fight. You wanted to fight in Israel, Grandpa? Emily had never heard this before. Tiny country. Six Arab armies. Six! How do you hold off six armies? I'd say it was a miracle, but it wasn't a miracle, he said, gaining steam. It was them. They did it. It was fight off those armies or die. That simple. Holocaust survivors, kids who had crawled through sewers to escape the Nazis, teenagers who weighed 70 pounds after starving in the forest for four years. They thought they were finally going to safety, and they went immediately into a war. That's awful, Grandpa. That's really awful. You should have fought, he said, shaking his head. I was a coward. I should have gone. When I was getting beat up in the street, called all sorts of names... You know what they called me? Christ killer. I didn't even know what it meant. Had to ask my parents. Who called you that, Grandpa? Emily had never seen Grandpa move so quickly from subject to subject. She wondered briefly if she should call his nurse Louisa to come check whether he was okay. The other kids in the street, he said. Everyone knew who the Jews were. I'd come home all beat up and my parents wouldn't say anything. My mom would just clean me up. I learned to throw a real punch from one of the neighbors who'd been a wrestler back in Europe. First time I landed one in some kid's face, I felt like a hero. But then I had to run so fast that his friends wouldn't turn me into ground turkey. (laughs) His laugh turned into a hacking cough, like he wasn't getting enough air. Grandpa, when was this? She asked. Late 30s, early 40s. We were paying attention to what was happening in Europe, what was going on in Palestine. We were so excited when they declared independence, so scared when the Arabs attacked. We were sure this was it, the end. They were going to be just like me, eight years old throwing clumsy punches and running away from the bigger, stronger kids. He stopped to catch his breath. But they weren't like me. They won and kept winning again and again. And after the war ended in 49, I said, that's it, I have to go. I got on a plane in 52, 22 years old. My ma didn't want me to go, said it was dangerous. There were still attacks coming in from over the border. Jordan, Egypt, you know. But I didn't care. I wanted to see it. I was there 10 days. Unbelievable country unbelievable people to see what they built he shook his head I should have taken you all but we got busy jobs, kids it was never a good time I went again alone in 68 I begged your grandma to come with me I have to see it I told her I have to be there they just won the war you understand 
Uh, she stammered. The Six-Day War took out the whole Egyptian Air Force in three hours. Five hundred planes. You believe that? Six days. This tiny little country gained territory four times its size. You understand that, Emily? Four times its size. They gave a bunch of it back, of course, but now they had power. Bargaining chips, you see? Yeah, I get it, Grandpa. You don't know, Emily. You don't know what it was like after that. I was so proud. We were all so proud. I'd never been so proud before. I went from little Solly Goldman being beat up in the street, called all sorts of names I won't repeat to you, to being proud to be Jewish, holding my head up high. Look at us. Not so weak after all. You understand what I'm saying? Of course, Grandpa. Of course I do. I'm not worried about this, he said, gesturing to the TV. They'll beat them back. Always do. But the way the world sees us, the way they report it, it's like they don't want Jews to be winners for too long. They're much more comfortable when we're dead. Then they can say, oh, those poor Jews, why didn't anyone help them? Why didn't they help themselves? The second we help ourselves, we're murderers, child killers. You're not going to see the truth on these news stations, Emily. You understand me? I do, Grandpa. <sighs> I'm tired, Emily, he said abruptly. His breath seemed to be coming more slowly, at a higher cost. Can you call Louisa for me? Tell her I want to take a nap. Sure, Grandpa. Emily got up to ask the nurse to come to attend to her grandpa. She wondered what Louisa thought about Grandpa's outburst. But Louisa was cheerful and diplomatic, helping Grandpa to his bed with a smile. Uh, should I stay? Emily asked Louisa when Grandpa was asleep. I can hang out, maybe bake something for him, brownies or something. Oh, he doesn't have much of an appetite, Louisa said. And I don't know when he'll wake up. Sometimes he sleeps until the next morning. It's six o'clock, Emily said. Louisa shook her head. He needs to rest. It's good you came. He talks about you all the time. Yeah. Thanks, Louisa. I'll come by again tomorrow. Good, but maybe tomorrow. Let's talk about exciting things. Noted, Emily said. So, Emily didn't tell Grandpa about what was going on online. The hate on Twitter. The little Palestinian flag emojis that started showing up on all her Instagram posts. This isn't even a post about Israel, she raged to Aviva over FaceTime. It's literally a babka. I baked a babka to get my grandpa to eat something, and some jerk I don't know responded to it with, Free Palestine. Like, what does my babka have to do with you? Literally yesterday, someone I had class with last year DM'd me that if I don't post something about, and I quote, the genocide in Gaza, she can't follow me anymore because it's clear where my loyalties lie. Like, what the hell? Why do I need to say something? I'm like 100% sure she DM'd me because I'm Jewish. I've never even posted a single thing about Israel in my life, ever. It's not just you, Aviva said. It's everywhere. Make your stuff private. There's like harassment campaigns going around. The Israel subreddit got shut down because they couldn't deal with the number of trolls. Are you getting it too? Emily asked. Aviva sometimes posted about Israel on her social media. Nothing too provocative. In more peaceful times, a picture from the Dead Sea. A shot of her at the Kotel. And now, a video of a rocket attack in Jerusalem. A photo of a home in Ashkelon, its windows blown out, its facade flecked with shrapnel. Aviva laughed. I'm literally getting death threats in my DMs. Or just like, insults. Die, colonizer scum, etc., etc. Ugh, I'm not even kidding. From who? No clue. I don't know who half these people are. Which is better than seeing people I know post all kinds of garbage about how terrible Israel is. Like people from school who I know for a fact 
wouldn't have been able to find Israel on a map last week, but now they're experts in everything. Seriously, go private. Yeah, maybe I will, Emily said. I'm like, afraid to go back on Twitter. Don't. Trust me. You don't want to dive into that cesspool, Aviva said. She exhaled noisily. God, I wish I were in Israel right now. Why? Aren't people there, like, in bomb shelters? Yeah, but it would be nice to be surrounded by people who get how awful this is. I don't feel safe right now. Even in Philly? Emily asked, shocked. I don't know. I have a couple of friends who say that I'm being, like, dramatic, but there are anti-Israel rallies and stuff here. The ones in New York got violent. And, like, if you know what to look for, you can tell I'm Jewish by the way I dress. I wouldn't have had to think about this if I were in Israel right now. (sighs) I can't believe I'm talking like this. I feel insane. I'm sorry, Emily said. Seriously, is there anything I can do? Focus on your Grandpa Em. I'll be fine. We'll get through this. It just kind of sucks right now. Wow, was it really that bad in the States? It was for some people. I didn't feel unsafe the way Aviva did, but like, I pass, you know? She lifts a lock of blonde hair. You know how many times I've been told, oh, you don't look Jewish because I'm blonde? No one knows until I say my last name. But online, that was different. I'm so glad I don't have social media. Yeah. It really sucked. So that was kind of a turning point for me. I kept thinking about all the stuff that my grandpa said and all the stuff that Aviva was saying and thinking like, maybe it would be better to be somewhere else for all of this. I kept thinking like, I never felt proud about being Jewish. I didn't feel ashamed. I just didn't feel anything. And so When I was, like, basically being bullied online just for posting, like, the most tangentially Jewish stuff, I was like, yeah, no, F this. I don't have anything to be ashamed of. I'm so sorry that happened to you. That sounds awful. It was a lot worse for other people. I'm not even that online. Did you see some guys in L.A. got attacked outside of, like, a kosher sushi place? They weren't even doing anything. It was literally because they were eating kosher. I didn't know that. That's terrible. Yeah. It happened a bunch. I think in London, also New York. It was obviously harder for people who are visible, you know? I was never afraid to show that I was Jewish before. My last name is literally Cohen, but now I was, like, second-guessing. If I post a picture of me in front of Hillel, is that going to set them off? If I post a picture with Aviva and she's wearing a Star of David necklace, is someone going to say something? You know, it was awful. So, you came here? Yeah. If I'm getting called out for posting a babka, then I don't think it matters what I post. Anyone who has a problem with me being here can just unfollow me and stop talking to me in real life. The trash takes itself out, you know? (laughs) I don't know that expression, but I like it. (laughs) Yeah, it's a good one. But you didn't come here right away. No. I figured I'd do birthright during winter break or something, but then my grandpa died in September, like right at the start of my senior year, and I stopped being able to concentrate on anything. Nothing seemed like it mattered, you know? You were depressed? Yeah. And I kept thinking, grandpa didn't care about my grades or achievements or whatever. He just wanted me to be happy, and I wasn't happy. So... I thought about doing the next best thing, going somewhere that would have made him happy. And here I am. So, are you happy you're here? Yeah, I'm really glad to be here. I'm glad I got to know all of you. I feel like each of you could teach like a semester-long class in Israeli history or Jewish history. There's so many things I want to learn about now. I think we learned a lot from you too. You're very brave. You're very kind and open-minded in a way that more people should be. Willing to question your own assumptions and, yes, delightfully neurotic. What he said. The other passengers chime in, agreeing. Emily squirms. Okay, guys. 
calm down. <laughs> Remember how annoying you thought I was when I was talking to my mom on the phone? <laughs> Emily, I hate to interrupt, but we all have to see this. Turn around. The towing truck is here. He points to the tow truck that's pulled up beside them, lights flashing. Behind it is another Monichi route. This one driven by a paunchy gentleman in a kippa. The passengers sigh in relief and begin gathering their things. Nahi falls into step next to Emily as they exit the taxi. See that taxi driver? Uh-huh. So, what do you think his story is? Thank you for listening to episode 10 of Homeland, 10 Stories, 1 Israel. Homeland is a production of Unpacked, a division of Open Door Media. Check out jewishunpacked.com for everything Unpacked related and subscribe to our other podcasts. Follow Unpacked at all the social media places like TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Just look for at Jewish Unpacked. This episode was written by Adi Elbaz and produced by Rifki Stern. Our team for this episode includes Adi Elbaz as Emily, Gideon Kimmel as Matan, Eric Ransom as Nahi, Cameron Nikad as Roe, and Ora Nash as Eden. Audio Magic was produced by Rob Perra. I'm your narrator, Ellie Schiff. Special thanks to Lucy Orsi and Rifki Stern for their help with the script. This show was made possible by support from the Coombe Family Foundation, the Crane Mailing Foundation, the Adam and Gila Milstein Family Foundation, and the Skolnick Family Charitable Trust. Normally on this show, we end with a teaser for what our next episode is about. And while this show is ending, and we don't have any new characters, stay tuned for something special. A behind-the-scenes conversation between our writer and the voice of Emily, Adi Elbaz, and our producer, Rifki Stern. They'll be discussing some of the questions that have come in from our listeners. So if you have any burning questions, send them in to homeland at jewishunpacked.com. We can't wait to hear from you.